So it's really important, I think, that we recognize these seven domains, these seven mountains, affect the world you're in, but the one that you have the most authority over is the family mountain. You pick the right one to focus on. My name's Lance Wallnow, and what I do is um, kind of a combination of different self-created things. So when, uh, when I was younger, I wanted to do entertainment. But then when I got older, I realized I had to make a living. So I found out the closest thing to making money entertaining is called sales. So I would work with different companies. But I also found out that you need to manage uh, growth because I had a dad who was in an executive in an oil company. And so he trained me in how to manage marketing, and I did sales. And then I became a Christian, and I had a problem because I found that Christians don't lie. And a great deal of sales has to do with the power of manipulated ideas in order to get people to do transactions. But someone who's got a conscience can only go so far in using the power of persuasion to get people to give them money. So um, I really fell out of love with sales and just really wanted to tell people about the gospel. And um, that led me to a unique proposition, which is church growth. Now, there's something you could sell that has integrity. So I got involved with church growth as a science consulting, worked in churches. And then one day, a pastor I was working with left the ministry, and I had to go from being the consultant to being the father of a church going through a trauma. And that, along with my wife, introduced me to the real world of where people live, raising children, multiple families, going through different situations. And we had kids of our own that we were raising up. Out of that, I said to myself, yeah, there's a great saying, it's from a guy named Kenneth Hagin, who said that when you're not in what God called you to do, but you're close, it's like taking a shower with your socks on. You're wet, but something doesn't feel right. And so when I was pastoring, it just didn't feel right. And I'd even travel, and people would say to me, are you sure you're supposed to do this? And I thought, am I that bad that everywhere I went, people would say that, you know, maybe you should be doing this for a living. But what I realized is there was something else I was called to do. And then I got the idea. I think it had to have been God. It came out of a meeting with Lauren Cunningham. So this guy, Lauren Cunningham, has Youth with a Mission. And Youth with a Mission is like a fabulous young organization. For, it's the world's largest, probably charismatic youth mission group. And he, he said to me, Lance, did I ever tell you the story about Bill Bright? I said, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade. He said, the two of us met once, and uh, we were really forced to meet each other because we, we come from different orientations. He's an evangelical, I'm more Pentecostal, but we both have the largest youth ministries in the world. So it was a donor that made us get together, and he forced us to meet. And we were a little bit awkward, but we found out right away we were great friends. He said to me, you know, Lauren, I've been seeking God about how to disciple the world and win the world to Jesus. And the Lord gave me seven world kingdoms. And he pulled out a piece of paper, and it had church and family and education and politics and uh, media and entertainment and uh, finance. And he said, what's amazing is, I had been seeking the Lord on a retreat when I was contacted by a mounted policeman who came to a tent in Colorado and said, you have a meeting with Bill Bright and handed me an envelope because my donor knew where I was seeking the Lord. And God gave me seven, seven mind molders of culture. I saw religion and family and academia and politics, and journalism, and uh, arts, and business. He said, and when we looked at it, we had all seven domains lined up, and it was, the, it was a confirmation of both of us. And I thought to myself, this actually should be told. And so I went to tell the story on a whiteboard because I thought it's complicated. I mean, I'm just re I'm repeating them to you, right? And it's like, oh, and da, 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 da. so I drew seven mountains. And I said, actually, Jesus was offered all the kingdoms of this world on a mountain, and he rejected them. The mountains represent world kingdoms, and these seven mountains represent those seven ideas. 
And so I presented that, and it started a whole different kind of chapter of life where people were, uh, Christians were beginning to wrestle with the fact that there's something other than just church and evangelism because we're impacted. I don't care what country's watching this. America's battle in politics is, is a realization that governments all over the world are central actors in, of great consequence in shaping the cultures of nations. And as those governments go, so go the families because they will impact the family structure. In uh, America, it's impacting the very dynamic of the definition of family. And in many of my uh, nations where I have Muslim friends and the Middle East and et cetera, they're not so pleased at the hubris and the arrogance of American progressives that in the name of uh, freedom are imposing their definition of family on family structures that don't approve of many things in America that we now give license to. So, so it's really important, I think, that we recognize these seven domains, these seven mountains affect the world you're in, but the one that you have the most authority over is the family mountain. You pick the right one to focus on because family, if put first, shapes all the other six. There's a couple of fundamental ideas that have to be recovered right now because the collapse of family is actually a, a, a matter of biblical prophetic significance. The very last chapter in the Old Testament, the, um, the one recorded, is written by the prophet Malachi. And the last words that he says is, that behold, I send Elijah to the earth, uh, who, will re who will restore the hearts of the children of the fathers and, and, and the fathers to their children, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The last words of the Old Testament is the word curse, and the promise is that God would send Elijah. And what does Elijah do? Elijah remedies the breakdown of the family. He's literally the prophet that symbolizes the turning of hearts from fathers to children and children to fathers. And it's interesting that there's an alienation between the male role there because the number one attack that's happening in the West is an attack upon males and men, masculinity in particular. Why is masculinity being attacked? I think it's because it's an out-and-out -out attack on, in terms of the Trinity, it's an attack on God the Father. So fatherhood is being assaulted. And then men feeling uh, guilty and shamed uh, because of, um, of their uh, masculinity begin to try to mute or, or to, to suppress that. And then what you have is an, as something which is very unhealthy in society. You have the absence of men doing what they're designed to do, which is by instinct is to protect and provide. And so you create this uh, emasculated male and confused gender becomes the, ne the necessary byproduct because you thought, if I'm gonna be less male, then what am I, more female? Now you've got men struggling with their identity. And you see, all of this is a curse, according to Malachi. So what Elijah represents is a prophetic clarity. It's an absolute, you could say, heaven sent moment of divine um, recovery of sanity. And, and so, Elijah shows up on Mount Carmel, confronts Jezebel, who is in a sense leading a seductive false religion, confronts Ahab, who is, by the way, a passive man who isn't using his authority as a king the way he's supposed to. And he basically breaks the seduction of what is trendy and reinstates the authority of God over an apathetic king. And I think that that's something which, uh, which everyone should take home and unpack right now. Because in your own family, men, whether they are more competent or more intelligent, doesn't matter. Men are charged with the responsibility of being the primary initiator within the family. Women, uh, contrary to all of the uh, liberation theology that you're listening to, actually are designed to be supporters of the man fulfilling that role. And so rather than the woman pushing the guy aside and taking over that leadership role, she should be challenging and encouraging and edifying the man to maturity, stepping into what he's called to be. When the man steps into what he's called to be, he creates a greater space for the woman to be what she's called to be. By and large, women have feminine energy, men have masculine energy, and the distinguishing factor between the two, based on research, is that masculine energy moves towards 
um, resolution of things, and feminine energy is more um, is more creative and free flow. So uh, when I'm doing seminars and things, we say like a ship that is carving a path through the ocean. That's masculine energy, but the winds and the sail that is capturing the current and carving its way is feminine energy. The feminine is, in a sense, responsive and creative and fluid and moving. That's why when you see feminine energy in females, it's angular, it's angular, it's angular, it's angular, it's angular. Masculine energy is always dominant. It's kind of like stationary and blunt. But there's a physiology of femininity, a physiology of masculinity. And it's because it reflects the order of a spiritual design. If the man does what he's called to do and is moving in the direction God called him to, then the woman is fulfilled to be able to move in the freedom of what she's called to do and the two become one in a far more healthy way. Modeling something for children that you can't get with a, a single mother who doesn't have a man to model something for the boys regarding responsible masculinity. We work with single mothers, and what, what we have to do is we have to bring those young men into the community of other males who have been domesticated by strong men. So you bring the tribe together. That's what a gang does, by the way, because if you do not have that masculine model in your home, you will go to the gang to find it. So it's, a, it's kind of a very, it's, it's a sense, it's, it's, a, it's designed in the warp and woof of humanity that we're tribal by nature, and it requires a certain amount of maturity to become a civilization. If we lose civilization, we go back to tribe. So the tribe in the inner city is the gang. And, uh, but in the gang, you have a hierarchy of male dominance. And then you have the leader, of the alpha, oddly enough, in charge of the gang. So you, so you still resort to that yearning for that masculine modeling. If you're a single mother, the smartest thing you can do is find a church. By the way, a church with a husband and wife who have their own relationships sorted out, where there are men in the church that can be involved with youth. Because if you have men that are involved with youth, then you have, you have a kind of a surrogate masculine role model that the uh, young men can key off of and see what it looks like. If they don't have that, you've deprived them of the one domesticating influence that takes the, the beast in men and tames them. And one of the number one factors which people miss that shapes a destiny is, believe it or not, the employment of the family that you grew up in. So if you stop and think about it, you don't repeat the work that your father did or your mother did, but your father and mother's work history shaped directly a destiny process item in your own development. So whatever their field was, it somehow influenced the fields that you moved into, and it showed you something about the way the world works. Occupation is one of the great factors nobody talks about in the shaping of destiny. And your parents' occupation had a great factor. And uh, given traditional roles of men and women, it's likely that if you're in my demographic age, which would be like 40 years old or older, what your father did for a living has had an impact on what you are doing. Not because you're doing what they did, but because they were in leadership, management, sales, service, some form of industry. Whatever it was they did, there was an ethos created for you to copy off of that and innovate your own form of what you do. So my wife has a dad who was a doctor. Now she didn't go to medical school, but she is in the business of healing people. And her dad picked a profession which was a happy one, which was obstetrician gynecologist. He wanted to have babies all, so he basically delivered thousands of babies because he said that's the one kind of doctor business where most of the time it's a happy story. And she births people in ministry, um, single moms, by the way. That's why, I'm, that's why I have opinions on the subject. She works with single moms who are underprivileged and under-resourced to help provide furniture, clothing, and food for them so that they can create a family environment and support their children's development. So, uh, so that's how come I, I'm very passionate about why family is critical. And while men need to be men and not be emasculated, and why women need to recognize men and the role they play so that they can create the kind of holistic environment that children can grow up in best. The point I was making is, is this really cool work that I do so for my consulting, which is on convergence. Convergence is, is, is a word um, coined by researchers at Fuller Theological Seminary on discovering destiny, on the moment when you're actually doing what you were created to do. And 
one of the and the first phase in that convergence development process is your family of origin called sovereign beginnings to go back and see that you don't have to resent or regret anything about your origin because God put you into the family you were in, in the gender that you're in, in the birth order that you're in, in the time of history that you're in, in the geography that you're in, the ethnicity that you're in, and in the occupation that your parents had that you grew up in because it all would shape the formation of his purpose for you. And so, in my mind, that first stage is all about the family, the home, and coming to peace with where you're at. And it's an important piece in, uh, in the destiny process of a person understanding who they are and where they're going. And it surprised me when I looked at the research. You know, and parents need to, I think, recognize that, that God has planned your time in history. He's planned your geography. He's planned, you know, people are always like, they have anxiety, like, you know, like they don't know if they can handle what's going on. Well, you have to figure out that God actually put you into the era that you're in. And built into that is a grace factor so that you're more than competent to be able to do what God called you to do. And the, uh, the secret sauce to me is in recognizing that if you take responsibility for the choices that you make, then you'll have the wisdom to make even better choices and life will open up for you the doors that give you access to the highest and best God has for you. That he has plans for you before you were born. And in a sense, we're, uh, we're in the remarkable process of walking with God and discovering the divine appointments that he already set before us. And that continues on until you exit planet Earth and enter his presence. God is love and love comes from God. In 1 John, the Bible tells us that God is not only all loving, but that he actually is love itself. The heart of the Parent Compass television show is to bring the transforming love of God to families everywhere. In every Parent Compass episode, true stories reveal family struggles and how their lives were radically changed by the love of God. Parent Compass, an award-winning television series, is completely funded by people like you. If you have been touched by God and you want to share God's love to others, would you please pass it on? Jesus tells us to go into all the world and to tell about Him. With your donation, you allow us to take this television show into many different nations and in many different languages, free of charge and a portion of your donation goes to Parent Compass Outreach to feed starving children. Your gift does so much. To make your tax deductible gift, go to parentcompass.tv forward slash donate. That's parentcompass.tv forward slash donate. And thank you for sending love and hope around the world.